It's okay. No one is going to care if your hair fell out from working out too hard. Yes, they will, Arya. My hair is all I have. You still have to do the episode. <sighs> Fine. Dear viewers, I know this may come as a shock to many of you, but... I like One Punch Man. I think it's a great satire that is stylish, funny, and when it is, fantastically animated. And while I wait for the next animated series to come out, I've been reading the manga. And it turns out that the last few chapters of the manga are so legitimately fun and cool and sciencey that today we are dedicating an entire episode to sciencing them. So consider this your spoiler warning for OPM chapters 170, 171, and 172. I will give you until we reach the projection hippodrome to go down into the comments and read those chapters, okay? We're off to the hippo drill. The hippo what? It's a, it's an old word that means I'm, I don't have any hair anymore. I'm losing my, leave me alone. Now entering the facility. Not only are the new One Punch Man chapters so sciencey, there are so many sciencey examples therein. So what I'm gonna do today is something a little different. I'm gonna be your anime annotator. We're going to go chapter by chapter, panel by panel, and stop wherever we can learn something interesting or calculate something fun. Sound good? Great. Stop looking at my head. We begin at the beginning of chapter 170. Hero Hunter Garu now has the power of absolute evil after being touched by God. It's pretty metal. And right on the first few pages here, we get some of the first science. Child Emperor's hair is falling out. Why? Well, it's now stated that Garu emits cosmic radiation, being so evilly evil. Now, cosmic radiation is radiation from the cosmos, from stars and other sources up there, and it consists of atomic nuclei, uh, subatomic particles, high energy photons, and this can irradiate you. Normally, the Earth protects you from that effect with its magnetosphere and atmosphere, but if Garu was standing right next to you, slamming you with cosmic radiations coming out at nearly the speed of light like the sun does, then it absolutely could hit you with something like acute radiation poisoning, which would lead to your hair falling out as high turnover rate cells, like the follicles in your head, started to die off. And a few pages later, we see that Genos states that he has some resistance to radiation, and that's true. A less biological thing would be more immune to that kind of thing. Then BAM! On page 19, Blast hits Garu with a gravity knuckle. Now, I don't know if Blast is changing the mass of his hand, but he could be emitting something like gravitons, the theorized carriers of gravitational force. If this is the case, he could make the effective gravitational pull of his fist like the surface gravity of a neutron star or something and accelerate Garu's face into his fist at extreme velocity. He states that he can manipulate the reality of the cosmos, so uh, why not? Blast then attempts to contain Garu in another dimension, which opens and then disappears completely. And this is actually how an alternate dimension would have to look completely invisible. Since we already have three dimensions of space, a fourth spatial dimension would have to be at right angles to all possible directions. Orthogonal to up, down, left, right, front and back simultaneously. Now if you can't really imagine an extra space in all possible spaces, don't worry, no human can. Garu then counters with a nuclear fission punch. Presumably, the strength of his attack is splitting atoms, which releases an incredible amount of energy as mass lost in the splitting is translated according to E equals MC squared. Material like your opponent's face is not made up of nuclear fissile material, however, so this would not actually lead to something like an atomic bomb on the end of your fist, but it's a fun idea. A serious punch squared starts chapter 171, and the energy unleashed worries Blast enough that he decides to vector it to another part of the solar system. Now, if he's that worried, it's probably a planet-destroying blast, and therefore it would have 2 times 10 to the 32 joules, at least, to overcome the gravitational binding energy of Earth. But more on that later. The redirected attack in the next panel shows that it left a hole in the stars. Totally impossible because even if the attack was traveling at the speed of light, it would take at least four years or so to reach Alpha Centauri, the closest star to our sun. But hey, it's a sick looking panel, isn't it? 
Now, moments later, Saitama and Garu are on Ayo. Now, this is a trip that would take at least 37 minutes in real time if they were moving at the speed of light, which they can't. So, in reality, the pair here would be tumbling for more like days or weeks or months. But the next page makes up for it right here with a beautiful panel that's reminiscent of a very real image. The Cassini's view of Io and Jupiter, January 1st, 2001. It's really pretty. Now it's time to get serious. Manga dorks are so hype on the most recent chapters because we finally see more of Saitama's serious moves. Like this insanity. The serious table flip. This is one of those things that's basically impossible to calculate without simpler assumptions. So what I'm gonna do is calculate the energy required to physically lift the crust of Io far into space. We don't know the exact composition of Io, but we do know that it has a dense silicate crust of around 50 kilometers deep with an average density of three and a half grams per cubic centimeter. Using some sphere geometry, we estimate the mass of the crust and we multiply that by the surface gravity and maybe Io's radius for some suitable distance. The energy that we get is the same energy it would take to turn all of Earth's crust into boiling molten slag. Dang. Saitama then uses the orbital debris to show his incredible speed in an absolutely incredible looking panel. It looks so good, I almost forgot about what my hair looks like right now. But the most ridiculous displays of power I've seen in a long time come in the next chapter. The fight between God Garu and a now naked OPM continues in the next chapter, but it's not going to last long because, as you can see, Saitama's power is increasing exponentially. A comic that actually puts exponential lines in something, oh, it's so cool to me. But can we actually learn something about math and about Saitama from this graph? I think so. Here I present to you some lines. The red one is linear. Its slope increases linearly with some scalar, in this case 50. The green line is exponential. It has some base value, in this case 2, and it increases its y value or coordinates according to x, which is the base value raised to an exponent hence exponential. Now on these pages, these lines do indeed look exponential, but to make sure and to learn something about OPM's power levels, I'm going to plot them exactly and find the real equation, serious series move, me. Assuming each line here represents one unit, I looked at all the units that looked exact, I didn't want to estimate too much, and put those unit sets into Wolfram Alpha for an actual exponential equation fitting to a line. It turns out that both Saitama and Garu have a similar growth constant, almost exactly the same, but OPM has a higher initial power value, in fact, four times higher. And this kind of makes sense in the context of the manga, right? Both Saitama and Garu can increase their power very quickly, but OPM has a lot more to draw upon, and therefore, when the exponential nature of this growth takes over, he will quickly outpace this hero hunter. It's like having more money in your savings account before it starts being compounded by interest. And so I declare these equations canon. And I guess any of you power scaling dweebazoids could use these to pit Saitama against any character of your choice. I know you like doing that on Reddit. What is all of this power used for? Well, maybe the most ridiculous display of strength I've ever seen in this medium. Serious sneeze. He blows away the surface of Jupiter with a sneeze and it gets all the way down to the metallic hydrogen and maybe rocky core. This sneeze is insane because excluding the mass of the sun, Jupiter makes up the majority of the mass of the solar system. So doing a similar and I must say extremely simplistic estimation of the energy required to do something like this, we use say maybe half of Jupiter's mass it looks like minus the core which we still see and see how much it would take to lift all that mass up out of Jupiter's enormous gravity well. And in doing that we get 1000 billion yada joules. The same energy you would need to Death Star the Earth and send all of its pieces off to mathematical infinity at the edge of the universe where not even Obi-Wan could sense what happened to them. And you could do that 10,000 times over. 
I agree, Garu. This is insane. Next, the space god demon bully guy spots Earth from Io with his Io balls. Shut up. It's impressive, but it's even more impressive than you think because from this distance, Earth is actually hundreds of millions of miles away. So Garu must have some kind of unspoken power here, which is like, internal eye magnification powers, at least hundreds of times going on what amateur astronomers have to use in their backyards to see the moons of Jupiter from where they are. Garo then uses some hyperspace teleportation nonsense to get back to Earth, thinking he left Saitama back in the Jovian system. Nope. How did Saitama manage this? Well, now here's the science I know you've been waiting for if you read these chapters, and uh... Space fart. That's how he did it. Space fart. Now, in theory, yes, farting in space can propel you around. All rocket science is, is throwing mass quickly in the opposite direction that you want to go. Farts have mass, and if you fart quickly, it will provide enough of a momentum change, a force on you, to move you around. And in fact, some spacecraft do this, use compressed gas to change their orientations and move them around. However, because Saitama is leaving Io, which has some surface gravity and he's escaping it very quickly, he has to have a tremendous force on his body and farts don't have a lot of mass, almost no mass in fact. And so using the ideal rocket equation and the mass of Saitama, which I have here, the mass of an average fart, which of course I always have on hand if I need it, and the escape velocity of Io, which I wrote in the margins for the next person to pick up this book to find, this fart would have to come out of his butt at six times faster than the speed of light. It's a faster than light fart, okay? It's completely impossible. But what do I know? I can't run 10 kilometers a day every day and do squats. <laughs> Once Garu is defeated, he decides to teach One Punch Man his ultimate move. Garu's intense radiation creates particles and antiparticles inside his body, which then start to mimic each other. The same thing then happens inside of OPM, and again, I have to give it to One and Murata here. Antiparticles, or antimatter, is in fact contained in and created by cosmic rays. Of course, if both their bodies suddenly contained a large amount of antimatter, it would instantly annihilate inside of them and create an explosion in order of magnitude larger than the largest nuclear explosion in history. <laughs> but in this case, the energy transports Saitama back in time, where he throws a punch into the past, defeating Garu before they even fought. Reversal of causality, totally unavoidable. Now I know that Saitama can fart faster than light, but everything else in the universe follows this speed limit. And so it demands that events only proceed forwards in time and never backwards. But One Punch Man getting so strong that he is now technically Zero Punch Man is so damn cool, I think the universe will let it slide just this once. One Punch Man and these chapters in particular are great examples of using scientific topics, principles, and ideas to elevate all the material around them. And I know other manga, comics, and TV shows do this same kind of thing very well, but I love seeing it in One Punch Man because it's a story that's intentionally over-the-top, ridiculous satire. By naming something Nuclear Fission Punch, for example, it just gives readers like me who are nerdy, like you probably are, something more to connect to and be in awe of. And, you know, that and light speed farting, I guess. Until next time. Now exiting the facility. Thank you so much to the very nerdy staff at the facility for their direct and substantial support in the creation of this here video. If you want to join the facility, if you want to try our proprietary instant hair regrowing formula, which I will use right after this video is done, you can go to patreon.com slash Kyle Hill and you get videos early, you get behind the scenes images and bloopy bloops, you get private members only live streams with Viola's truly? Yeah, and I do funny voices. And if you support us just enough, you get your name on Aria here in every single video. And as you can see, there's literally hundreds and hundreds of you. So I have no idea how I'm going to pass that. Um, if you have any OPM, One Punch Man, feats of strength or amazingness that you want me to look into, make sure to put them in the comments below. I will be watching as my hair slowly regrows back to its former glorious state, which is, of course, incredible. 
immense. Thanks for watching. I'm going to start on my squats right now. One, two, three.